The United States is used to being the biggest economy in the world. We've been the biggest economy in the world since 1870. And we probably will be by GDP for another 20 years or so, 25 years. China is bigger than we are now by purchase price parity measurements. But still, it's something I'm not as worried about as you probably are, because I'm older than you and I'm not going to live to see the problems. <laughs> this isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. David, I really wanted to just ask you about your opinions on the economy. I, just from my own perspective, everything seems to me, with my limited experience, more unpredictable than I've ever seen it before. Just because this time things are different in terms of the circumstances that led up to this. My general view is that the Federal Reserve um, is being very cautious, as you saw from Jay Powell's uh, most recent statement in uh, at the uh, uh, Grand Tetons uh, um, retreat in, in Jackson Hole. Um, I think that he's very afraid of being seen as um, too dovish and saying, well, we've conquered inflation. It's down to 3% or so, and we can definitely next year reduce interest rates. He made it clear that we're not out of the woods yet, and therefore the market is assuming the chance of another 25 basis point increase this year is reasonably good, though it's not guaranteed. Uh, the Fed does not want to be in the embarrassing position of saying inflation has gone down, we can begin lowering interest rates, and then they have to backtrack. That's the last thing they want to do. It destroys their credibility. So their credibility is premised on you know, basically taking us in the direction that they said they're going to get us to, and that is 2% and inflation rate. I think that's very difficult to do, but certainly we're not there yet. So I would expect that probably another 25 basis point increase at some point this year and probably not a lowering, at least until uh, we're past the first two quarters of next year. Well, you know, I'm curious because before the pandemic, or right around the time of the pandemic, like March 2020, the Fed's biggest concern was deflation. They couldn't seem right, to right. lower interest rates enough. And so at some point they decided, hey, we don't need to be at 2%. We're going to, we need to be around there. We're going to overshoot a little to try to get inflation rather than deflation. And then, of course, they overshot too much. Could it be that they're overshooting too much on the downside, given that we really don't know the actual future effects of the recent I, uh, rate hikes? Well, of course, um, it, you know, it's much harder to get out of deflation than to get out of inflation, because as the Japanese and others have learned over the years, uh, reducing or getting out of deflation is much more complicated than, than getting out of inflation. Uh, I think the Fed... Um, did not want to uh, increase interest rates at this level uh, to get and, and get some inflation into the system. I think the COVID basically scared the policymakers in the Trump administration and in the Biden administration into taking action because um, they thought the economy would be so slow and so low that they had to inject enormous amounts of liquidity into the market. They did so thinking it would be transitory, and then it turned out it wasn't transitory. So then they have to live with the, the consequences of injecting so much money uh, through um, you know, various uh, programs into the economy. So at the moment, as we talk today, uh, I'd say there's always no complete consensus in Washington, but I'd say a, a reasonable consensus is that we may have dodged a bullet on a hard landing. Now, there are some people who say a hard landing is inevitable and that when every time you increase interest rates as high as they have done here, you ultimately get a so-called hard landing or a recession. But at the moment, we don't seem to be going in that direction because the unemployment rate is very low. Uh, the GDP is holding up. We don't see evidence of uh, massive uh, um, you know, concern about the ability of the, of the, local, of the consumers to, to, be, to be willing to spend money. And so as a result of this, you're probably going to have GDP this year at somewhere around 1.5%, 1.7% which is better than you would get if you were going to get into a hard landing. Now, I yeah, no, uh, Oh, go ahead. I interviewed a person recently named Jeremy Grantham, who you probably know. Yes. He's a fairly bearish person. Generally, he's always looking for, um, you know, bubbles. And he's, he did tell me in the interview I did with him that he thinks we still will have a, uh, a recession at some point as a result of all the increases in interest rates. 
But most people would say right now, the consensus so-called, is that we may have dodged a, uh, a recession or a so-called hard landing, but it's still a little early to tell. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's interesting because unemployment is at historic lows. Could it be the case that people are just completely leaving the workforce? They're either retiring if they're older or they're doing more freelance and kind of uh, uh, right. what you call it, side hustle job type jobs as opposed to participating okay. in the workforce. There's three things that people should think about. Uh, first, the unemployment rate appears to be very, very low uh, in light of how high interest rates are going. T typically, if you increase interest rates, you get unemployment to go up as employers stop hiring. The reason it probably hasn't happened here are three reasons, I think. One is that a lot of people dropped out of the labor force, workforce, uh, when COVID came. Older people, 55 and older, basically, they stayed home and then they didn't want to go back to the office and they ultimately retired. Younger people went back to school or started living with their parents and they haven't really rejoined the, the labor force. Uh, so as you know, as you know, we usually have about 66% of adult males and females in the labor force and now we've got about 62%. So we have a smaller percentage of of theoretically eligible workers in the workforce. Second, we don't have a lot of um, immigration going on right now. So um, let me put it in this, in this terms. And for a population to stay the same, a population needs to have women of childbearing age have 2.1 children on average when they're in their fertile years. Uh, our population, our, our and women in the United States are reproducing at 1.6 uh, children per, per woman of fer or fertile age. So we're reproducing uh, at a lower rate than we would just to keep the population the same. And um, we're not Im letting immigration come in very much. And so immigration is, uh, you know, it's been thwarted under the Trump administration and the Biden administration. You don't have a lot of legal immigration. And as a result, a lot of the jobs that would normally be filled by immigrants, uh, place jobs at restaurants, service uh, stations, um, get, uh, uh, pharmacies and things like that, drugstores, food stores, you don't see those jobs um, being filled so much by new immigrants anymore because the new immigrants aren't here. And that's another factor. A third factor is that um, you have to remember what the unemployment rate really is. It's a, it's a compilation of how many people look for a job in the last uh, 30 days. And so the data may not be completely accurate, um, but I know from my own experience in business now, it's very hard to get employees um, at certainly the lower economic uh, levels of compensation to, to come to work and to and to uh and to, and to hire these people so uh, a lot of factors are going on that probably make it unlikely that we're going to have high unemployment anytime soon right so so i don't know if i really count those numbers in some sense in terms of whether we're going to be in a recession or not i mean well another way to look at it is with interest rates having moved up so fast the cost to buy a home for a middle-income family that requires a mortgage has basically yes, dr dramatically higher. And as a result of that, uh, developers, to the extent there are still real estate developers uh, who are, have money left, what they're really doing is building uh, rental housing uh, and apartments, uh, not so much houses for, for sale, because it's easier now to get people to rent something because people are having a hard time getting mortgages. Um, and right now, people who have mortgages and uh, want to sell their houses and move elsewhere are having a hard time doing so because they can't find the many buyers out there that can get a mortgage. And also, um, you know, these people can't really um, um, easily uh, get new mortgages themselves at the rates that they could that they would have to pay today if they were buying a new house. So the housing market is very, very slow and very um, inactive at the moment. The rental market is where you're seeing much more real estate activity. Right, but the housing industry and, and building homes is a huge part of the economy. Right, like all peripheral industries. It has historically been, and that's why um, you know people are worried about whether we're going to go into some kind of quote recession. In part because real estate often leads you into a recession. Uh, and, and and one of the things we haven't yet seen really good data on is how bad is the urban office market. For example, um, in large cities, New York, San Francisco, Chicago. You have very high um, uh, rates of people not coming to, to work. In other words, they don't come to work. They, they, uh, they work at home five days a week or three days a week or whatever it is. Employers have had a hard time getting employees to come back to work. And it may well be that we're at the beginning of a, uh, 
four day or three day in the office work week that's permanent. And if that's true, then what you're going to see is that fewer uh, leases are going to be renewed at the the space that people had because they're going to need less space, and they're going to also uh, be able to try to get them at lower rents. So you're going to have a very big uh, distressed de- real estate debt market soon because the debt on major office buildings in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, are uh, it's it's uh, they're going to have very high default rates. Let's say, and they're already beginning to have default rates, and the banks don't really want to take back the the debt at this point, but at some point they may be forced to do so. And so what will happen then? I mean, when all these uh, commercial real estate investors and developers start going bankrupt and the banks don't want the bill. I mean, in San Francisco, they're literally just handing over the keys and saying, you take it now, we can't deal with this. Well, typically what you do is you can't service the debt. You're you're, you're foreclosed by the bank. The bank takes it back and then they ultimately sell it probably at a 15% maybe 20% discount to what they had carried it for. Today, one of the reasons the banks don't want to take the uh, the debt back and they're not rushing to take it back is the discount would be 35 or 40%, if not 50%. And therefore, they would have to reflect that on their balance sheets, whereas right now they might be marking it down by 10 or 15 or 20%, not fully to where the market would take it. So the banks are not dying to take these buildings back right now. But at some point, they probably will. At some point, the regulators will say, you've got to recognize the real value of the of the of the mortgage. Um, it's a big problem for banks and it's a big problem for the real estate developers. I mean one of the things that happened in 2007 2008 is that banks started to realize the p- potential losses from the um, you know personal real estate market and and that's what you know all these banks then went out of business all these derivatives collapsed. Could something similar happen in commercial real estate? Well it could. Um, I, I'd say when, you know, when the government, I, I, right now, um, the major banks in the United States have more real estate on their books than they really want, but it's not easy to dispose of it. Um, at some point, I suspect you'll, you'll see a market in distressed debt in real estate in commercial buildings that hasn't yet happened yet in any major way in terms of, uh, being analogous to what's happened before. Uh, it's possible. I don't know the, and when the SNL crisis happened in the late eighties, that was a situation where we had so much real estate that the government, in fact, had to take it over and ultimately sold it. Uh, it turns out probably at lower prices than they probably should have. Um, in 07, 08, you saw a lot of people buying back debt at discounts, and they made money in the end. Right now, though, we're talking about debt that discounts that are so much higher than what we saw in 07, 08, that it's not quite clear what's going to happen. It's one thing to say that debt is worth 85% of what it once was, but to say it's worth 50%, is another factor. And, 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 the, and the reason it's so much lower in terms of the value is this. One, interest rates are higher. So when interest rates go up, by almost by definition, the value of a building goes down. And secondly, people are coming back to work, as I mo- noted earlier, at a lower levels, and therefore, uh, you don't need as much office space. So when people are going to uh, renew leases, they're not going to renew them at the same space that they probably had before. Right. So So is this... Is this kind of a problem that we're closing our eyes to, or is there going to be potential well, solutions? Well, people are not closing their eyes to it, but I'd say it's not yet on the front pages of the, of the newspapers as a as a crisis because you have a, a lot of um, people, you know, or are, are, are have other problems to worry about. But I think in the real estate community, if you talk to people in the real estate community, they see this as the potentially one of the bigger crises they've ever seen in commercial real estate. Right. And so, so what could happen and like compared to 2007, 2008 and, and the economy almost collapsed. However, I, maybe, you know, the Fed under Bernanke developed a playbook, which is get more involved right. early. Well, we'll have to see where we are when, when the crisis hits. It's not likely to hit in a dramatic way for another one or two years because it's going to take a while for this to play through the system. At that point, the interest rates may be lower. And therefore, the problem may be ameliorated by lower interest rates to some extent. But I think the biggest factor overall is that fewer people are going to work in offices than before five days a week. Now, some of the financial service firms in New York are telling their people they have to come back five days a week. And some other employers, Amazon recently said, we want you back five days a week. But getting employees to come back five days a week in a very tight labor market isn't often that easy to do because uh, employees can go elsewhere. 
Right. So so could this lead to a potential deflation if um you know if banks start suffering, perhaps lending less, commercial real estate starts you know trading all this distressed debt, and a, a lot of those employees you mentioned aren't necessarily going back to office buildings. A lot of the Amazon employees are going back to warehouses, for instance, where right. real estate's not really in a crisis. So so I'm wondering um, if overshoot. I, I would say historically. Side. Uh, the United States hasn't struggled with deflation that much in recent years because it's been a reasonably dynamic economy. Uh, Japan had a very bad decade or so of deflation because the economy wasn't growing very much and wasn't a lot of entrepreneurial activity. I think in the United States, deflation is not one of our one, two, three, or four, five biggest problems we have to worry about right now. Right. Although, although before COVID hit, uh, I mean, that was what the Fed was worrying about because they, they couldn't really inflate things. You're right. But that's, more... it's different. I mean, the world's changed. And so as a result of having inflation hit as high as 9%, um, now it's probably at a core rate of maybe three and a half or 4%, uh, so-called core inflation. But, but, uh, that's deflation, not something we have to worry about today. And does it worry you uh, on the inflationary side, the the BRICS countries considering currencies other than the U.S. for for purchasing oil? That is a uh, potentially serious problem for the United States in this sense. We are the only reserve currency in the world. Uh, we don't have a sovereign wealth fund, unlike of many other countries, but we have uh, the printing press. And we can print as many dollars as people are willing to buy. And for the last 50 years or so, we've been the only reserve currency and people have been willing to buy our dollars. They've been willing to buy it so easily from us that we've run up about $32.7 trillion of debt. So how, you know, how can you run up that much debt? Well, you run it up because people are willing to buy your dollars. If the dollar it is, goes down in value, in part because uh, there is another reserve currency, yes, we surely will have a problem. I don't see that in the, in the near term. I don't see any currency really competing against the dollar in a serious way in the near term. But you know, 10 years from today may be different. By the next five years or so, the dollar is likely to be the only reserve currency. Yeah, is, is it fair to say, like, like for instance, a few weekends ago, uh, India bought oil in rupees. But is it fair to say that Saudi Arabia and other countries don't really want to hold rupees that much compared to the dollar? I think that's an understatement. Yes, that's true. Um, look, India has been buying a lot of oil, and I think China has as well, at discount rates. Um, to um, from 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 Russia, um, and if buying them in rupees, uh, in, in 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 buying them in, uh, in the, sometimes they've been buying them in rubles. But if buying them in uh, in twenty uh, percent discounts, what they're doing is the oil ultimately is being refined in the United States or elsewhere and sold back to the United States or in Europe at the market rate. So you know, for India and China, uh, the Russia need to find markets as really. Uh, made it profitable for a lot of people in the oil business in India and China. Hmm. But in terms of them replacing the dollar as, as kind of the reserve currency to buy oil with, you don't think that's it happening? Uh, but, well, in the reserve currency world, to be a reserve currency, you have to have enormous amount of um, uh, public disclosure. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the Chinese have said for many years, they don't really see the need to make the RMB a reserve currency. They don't hmm. want to disclose all the kind of things you have to do if you're a reserve currency. Um, people might from time to time uh, buy oil in other currencies, but I suspect uh, they will quickly um, convert it into dollars as soon as they can. You know, on, on the optimistic side, the one thing it seems in each case of a recession that the U.S. always has going for it is that we innovate new industries out of nothing. And so, you know, the internet, uh, biotech, genomics, right now AI, does this give hope for uh, you know, the, the increases in productivity that each one of these new industries gives us? Does that give you hope that we can sort of weather any sort of crisis, economic crisis? Well, the United States, um, you're correct, has found many new ways to innovate and make our economy more productive. Uh, AI will probably uh, be a, a quantum leap in, in productivity when it's fully implemented in many ways. Um, I don't. I don't worry about the U.S. economy in, in, in that respect. I think the United States economy will innovate sufficiently to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, but there's always a difficult transition period of time, and some people will lose their jobs. Other people will get jobs they wouldn't have otherwise had. 
Um, so it, you know, the, the, the transition is always difficult in China. Uh, one of the curses that people give to other people is to say, uh, may you be condemned to live in a time of transition because transitions are so difficult at times. And, uh, it will be for workers in the United States and many people who have to transition and learn new job skills. Right. So, so, uh, the, the U S by, by innovating in productivity, uh, is essentially maybe maybe it doesn't need as large a workforce, or maybe it doesn't need uh, the inflation that usually comes when you don't have these increases in productivity. I'm just I'm just trying to think if if the innovation itself is replacing what what typically lower interest rates or or higher money supply would do. Well, innovation is is no doubt a factor that can overcome some other challenges they'll have in the economy. Um, in the United States has been the leader in entrepreneurial activity for sure. Um, but, you know, it's just hard to, to tell it during a transition period of time who's going to benefit and how much the United States will benefit. Uh, as Warren Buffett likes to say, nobody's really made any money over the last hundred years or so betting against the United States economy. When you tend to bet against the United States economy, you tend to lose. Now, there's no guarantee the United States economy will be the biggest in the world in our lifetime. And probably China will surpass us at some point. But I think uh, the United States economy is still in reasonably good shape and likely for the next 25 to 50 years to still be a dynamic, large uh, economy, one of the most important, if not the most important in the world. Well, what, what about the debt? Like you mentioned the, the $32 trillion in right. debt. Like yes. when does, when does for, for my entire life, I feel like people have been saying the debt is a problem, the national debt is a problem, but it never really has been a problem. So what well, is the issue? What could be a problem? Okay. There are five ways to solve this problem. Number one, you uh, increase um, taxes. Well, that's very unpopular. Number two, you cut spending, even more unpopular, particularly because 85% of the budget is defense spending, entitlements, and so forth. So it's very hard to cut and interest. Number three, you can go to the IMF and say, we, we need a bailout. Well, obviously, we're too big for that. Four, you can say, "Looks, whoops, we're sorry we borrowed too much. We default. Obviously, can't do that either. There's only one alternative, and that's to do what we're now doing, in effect, inflate your way out of it. Uh, the only way out of this is for your children and my grandchildren and so forth to be paying this debt off uh, 20 years down the road at inflated dollars. That's the only solution. Um, the United States has had debt since it started. The, con the country started, we had about $70 million of pre-revolutionary war or post-revolutionary war debt that we had to pay off. Um, during the Clinton years, we had three years of surplus surplus. Uh, and for your listeners, um, a surplus is when you take in more money than you actually spend. Uh, many people in my children's generation don't know what that is because they haven't seen a surplus. But a surplus did actually exist a couple of times in the 1990s. Uh, but I don't think we're going to have that anytime soon. Again, we, we, we're we running about a 1.6, one, 1.7 1. trillion dollar annual deficit now. So a 1.6, 1. 1.7, yeah, trillion annual deficit. And, you know, we ran up... Uh, I think under President Obama, it was in eight years, we ran up about, I would say, I think it was roughly $8 trillion of additional debt. Under President Trump in four years, about $9 trillion of additional debt. It's so in this century, we've run up enormous amounts of debt under President George W. Bush as well. Um, and I don't think we're going to pay that off anytime soon. But the reason it's that people talk about it and don't do anything about it is because the bond markets are still willing to uh, sell U.S. debt because it has an advantage. It's it's a large amount of money, and when you you buy these treasury bills, you know you're going to be paid back. Uh, you don't have to worry that the uh, the, the the dollar is going to be um, deflated or or uh, devalued in very many ways. Or and you know the U.S. government is going to pay it back. Well, why don't you go buy Argentina debt, Argentina's debt, or go buy Brazil's debt, or go buy many other countries' debt because you're not sure they're going to be able to pay it back. Uh, what about Japan? Japan can pay its debt back. So why are people Move, move into the Japanese debt as a substitute because their economy isn't big enough to um, to sell enough or need to sell enough tr treasury bills. One of the advantages that our economy has, it, quote, advantages, is that we borrow so much money. We have so many treasury bills out there that if you're China or you're Saudi Arabia or Japan and you need to park lots of money and get a reasonable interest rate, get your money back, you know, U.S. dollars is about the only game in town. You, you know, you mentioned that the, the, the fifth way of getting out of inflation was to, I mean, out of this debt is to inflate our way out of it. Again, could could innovation be a sixth way in the sense that, okay, you can't raise taxes, but you can collect more taxes 
if your industries are right. exporting enough to the rest of the world because they're they're new and they're great. Well, let me put it this way. Um, under uh, President uh, Biden, I think one of the early bills that was passed was a bill to get, I think it's maybe 80,000 more IRS agents or employees. So the theory is that you have more IRS agents and employees, you get you collect more taxes. But that's now you know very subject to uh, criticism, and, and the Republicans are very much against that. And uh, so, sure, you can always collect more taxes, and there's a lot of more taxes that can be collected legally and without ra raising interest rate, ra raising tax rates. But there's a big resistance in Washington D.C. in certain political circles to increasing the 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 ability of the IRS to get more money back. But but not just not just by collecting more taxes that currently exist, but by creating industries that just make more money, oh. so uh, more revenues are generated, so more taxes are are. Well, sure, um, of course, that's always a good way to do it. it. Just takes a while for it to happen. So take artificial intelligence. You know, is it really going to produce a lot and more tax revenue in the near future? It's hard to know um, because in this country we tend to defer taxation. Uh, when things increase in value, but they're not, there's no liquefaction event. So if you invest in the leading artificial intelligence company in the world, and it, you know, uh, and you just hold on to the stock, uh, you don't sell it, then there's no big increase in taxes. Right, but the the company itself will generate revenues and profits and export yes. technology to other countries and so on. That's that's true, and it's it's a good thing. But remember. If you look at the tax bills being paid by some of the largest companies in the United States, they don't seem to be paying uh, as high a rate as you might think. Hmm. And and you know you, we also have some of these exponentially growing industries like genomics, where it's small now compared to the rest of the healthcare industry. But for all we know, in five years, ten years, it could be curing every disease. Oh, sure, it could be. I mean, when I worked in the White House in the late 1970s, healthcare was seven percent of the U.S. GDP. Now it's twenty-two percent, and it's growing. And it's growing because not only of new things like genomics and other kinds of incredible marvels, biotech and other things, but you, you find that people are living longer. In 1934, when the Social Security Act was passed, uh, the average uh, life expectancy was 65. In 1900, the average life expectancy in the United States was 49. Now, you know, if you're white in a reasonably prosperous area, uh, you're likely to live, you know, to in your, your early 80s or if not longer. And uh, you know, could could this could this aging population and and higher rates of retirement could this make the bill come due earlier in terms of entitlements like on Social Security and and Medicare? Oh, Medicare. it's already it's already coming due. Um, for example, um, you know, in 1934, the average life expectancy, as I mentioned, was roughly 65, and you could retire and collect your Social Security benefits when you were 65. So. Most people didn't live that long after they were starting to collect benefits. Now, if the average you know, life expectancy of certain sectors of the economy is 82, 83, 84, you, you know, you're taxing people at an insufficient rate to, uh, to, uh, to really pay for all that. Uh, we have what we call in this country a social security system that's called pay as you go, which means that when you get your, w, when you pay, get your, your, your payroll check every, every week or every other week, uh, there's a deduction for FICA. Social Security. Well, that's going to pay your grandmother's Social Security um, needs or um, or benefits right away. In Canada or Australia, they have different systems there where they actually have real money that is designed to be available to pay the uh, the in, the the uh, benefits that are due to people when they retire. We don't have that. It's a big problem in our country, but we're not going to solve that anytime soon. Right. So that could lead to more debt or more printing or whatever you call it, and, and that's. That's a problem because eventually, eventually the debt comes due, it, or, or it doesn't, because it, it seems like this has always been a problem. Kick it down the road is was basically our our model for a long time. What they did in Canada about twenty years ago or so, they started a system where they actually had um, money set aside from I guess tax revenues and and then from employer contributions and employee contributions, and they have a dedicated fund that's now very very large that's available to pay the the pensions that are due. But we don't have that. We just, you know, it's as I say, it's pay as you go. I, I wonder, and I know about solutions like this have been bandied about, but I wonder if uh, a federal national sales tax on the one side and a lower uh, flat tax on the income side 
would would raise the money because a flat tax on the income side would would make it simpler for people to pay, particularly right. if it's a little lower. And a federal sales tax allows you to kind of well tax first, almost um, visibly. Well, the, the states which make get a lot of their money off of sales taxes don't want a federal sales tax because that would, you know, basically mean they would it would cut into uh, probably the revenue that they're going to get. Secondly, sales taxes are seen as regressive, which is to say, wealthy people the sales tax doesn't mean as much, but the poor people it's it's a bigger uh, problem. And uh, and also, flat taxes are seen as uh, by the Democratic Party as basically a giveaway to wealthier people because. You want the wealthier people to pay a higher rate, and if you're paying a flat tax, it's going to be the same for everybody. So the result is going to be you're going to probably, in the view of many Democrats, you're going to basically let wealthy people pay less taxes, and you probably won't collect as much revenue. But you know, some presidential candidates have tried that as a part of their platform when they run, and it doesn't get very far. I wonder why, because the, the math probably does add up to more money collected. Because yes. more people would pay. It's, it would be simpler to pay. More people would simply pay. Yes, but if you say, should Bill Gates be paying the same rate, the same rate as the guy working in the post office, most people would say probably not. But that's what a flat tax does. Everybody pays the same rate. Now, obviously, some people have uh, more income. But there's a general sense in our country for many years now that progressive taxation is a good thing. And as a result, you have higher rates on, on wealthier people. I think it's very difficult to get Congress to change that. Yeah. So on the one hand, we have real problems. And on the other hand, there are people for political purposes sort of avoiding solving all the problems. And, and it seems like the only thing that could really help solve the problems that you outlined or the, the five solutions that you outlined is, is innovation. And I don't know how you... What's well, innovation the helps for sure. Um, but in the end, we basically have a social net for people in this country, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, that is a gigantic part of the budget. And we don't have the growth rates in our economy to really justify everything today. And therefore, that's why we have the kick it down the road approach, which is to say, um, we'll, we'll, we'll borrow more money. So we can borrow more money for foreseeable future. And, and, and until the markets won't buy the debt anymore, we can keep doing this. But you know, I don't know if it can continue forever. So, so what happens then? Well, um, if you read books about this, generally what happens is, uh, uh, and, and Ray Dalio wrote a very good book about this not long ago, basically saying, in effect, that throughout history, countries which have the only reserve currency, such as, such as the, uh, the guilder that the Dutch had or the, uh, the uh, sterling or pound that the British had, ultimately they take advantage of it by selling so much debt because it's the reserve currency and people want to buy it that they borrow too much. And they borrow too much. Ultimately, you have a high inflation and the value of their reserve currency goes down and people don't want it anymore. So at some point, if we keep borrowing at the rate we have, at some point, I don't know when, it may not be in my lifetime, but we will not be the only reserve currency or we will have um, you know, a situation where people just won't want to buy the dollars because they're not worth as much as they thought they were when they were buying them. And, and, and this does, on the one hand, the way you describe it, it does seem like a catastrophe. On the other hand, England and Japan both have survived as, or let's take a look at England in particular. They survived not being the world's number one economy. I mean, they were for a long time and now they're not, but they're doing pretty good. So, okay. I mean, G, uh, you, United Kingdom now is roughly 3% of the world's GDP. We are roughly 18 or 19%, something like that. So we're a much bigger economy. The UK amazingly controlled the world for many ways. They, they, you know, with 20,000 soldiers in India, they controlled India. They had a, a fleet that basically was the largest fleet in the world. So, you know, if you live in London now, it, you, you don't have the, the kind of uh, per capita net worth and, and wealth that you had 100 years ago, in effect. But people seem to be, as you suggest, doing OK. Uh, the United States is used to being the biggest economy in the world. We've been the biggest economy in the world since 1870. And we probably will be by GDP for another 20 years or so, 25 years. Um, China is bigger than we are now by purchase price parity measurements. but but still, uh, you know, it's something I'm not as worried about as you probably are because I'm older than you and I'm not going to live to see the problems. <laughs> you're, kicking, your you're kicking the can to me and my kids. Well, um, yeah, my kids too and my grandchildren, they're going to deal with it. But I, I'll be watching from somewhere, I hope. And, and David, what are you currently working on? Is there another book on the horizon? Yes, I'm working on a book on the American presidency. 
I've done a lot of interviews with people who have been presidents of the United States or people that have studied the presidents of the United States, and I have my own, my own views on it. So that'll come out, I hope, next year. And what's, what's, the, um, what's the idea of the book? What's the... Well, the theme is that uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's the most important job in the world, and maybe we can find better ways to um, you know, either elect this person or to, uh, to deal with some of the consequences of uh, not uh, um, allowing the system to work as way the founding fathers wanted it to work. But you know, it's no perfect, easy answer. Like, like in terms of elections, how come they've never adopted the internet or some form of secure internet to, to make votes? This way, we don't have any of these issues that we see we see popping up in every election. Well, because um, the internet is 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 very subject to hacking, and so uh, you know, I mean, you're going to give the Russians or the Chinese or North Koreans complete access to our uh, election system if you do that. You know, the thing that's most interesting is to me is. Uh, is when this country was started, we had, uh, in 1776, we had 3 million people in it, 3 million people. A half a million of those 3 million were, were, were slaves, and they couldn't be in government. And a, one and a quarter million of the remaining uh, people who were white were women, and they couldn't be in government. And then if you were Jewish, you couldn't be in government either. And, uh, and then you had about 500,000 people who didn't own any property. So you have about 500,000 white Christian property-owning men who could participate in government. Out of those 500,000, you got George Washington, John Adams, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, among others. Now we have 330 million people. And what do we have? Well, we don't see a lot of George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons, do we? So well, where, where are all the great people? Well, my theory is they all went into private equity. <laughs> Which conveniently is where you were, well, and you and you went from politics into private equity, right? Right. And, but I mean, but, to, be, to be very serious, uh, you know, I wish it would be good if we could get people to come into the political world who haven't been professional politicians or people, um, you know, who who seem to be, um, you know, more attentive to some of the real issues we have to deal with. But now there's so many, there's so much money involved to to elect a president that. Uh, you know, they yes. have, everybody has to cater to special interests. Alexander Hamilton didn't have to cater to any special interests. George yes. Washington had no special interests. In the uh, last campaign, uh, Bush, I mean, uh, Biden versus Trump, roughly on the entire election for everybody counting, uh, counting all the dollars, almost six, six billion dollars was spent. Right. A lot of money. That, that's why you don't you you have to be skilled at other things than than statesmanship and governing in order to win. You have to you have to know how to raise money. You have to have I, you have to do much. It's different. I mean, I over the weekend I an event uh, I interviewed uh, a candidate who's running for president who's very different. I'm not I don't support candidates one where I stay out of politics, but I interviewed him. His name is Vivek Ram Rasamy Rasamy right Vivek Vivek. And, and uh, I, interesting guy. So he he's a case where he's not, you know, he's not coming from a political background. And some people right. are supportive of that. Some people are critical of that. But uh, w what did you think overall? It's very. Well, very I would say, um, you know, clearly getting people in, not from a political background may have pluses. You know, there are a lot of talented people who aren't in political backgrounds. Um, he is young. He's only 38 and has not served in government at all. But he's obviously very uh, articulate, and as I pointed out to him, doesn't lack in self confidence or self assurance. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be interesting in a couple elections in the next few elections, and I really look forward to this next book. When's it coming out? Sometime, I hope, in the spring. Excellent. Well, I look forward to talking to All you right. about it then, and thank you so much, David. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Joining us on the podcast. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.